This meeting will be recorded. If you don't want to show your faces, uh, this is the time for that. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is Parker Community Office Hours, our very first one. So the, we have a Parker Code of Conduct. Uh, it applies, you can check it out in our uh, document, like meeting document. I will share the link in a minute. But overall, please be nice to each other. Uh, we would love to be a welcoming community. So with that, we have a couple of agenda items. And I think first one from Matthias, if you want to take it away, you can go ahead. I actually would love to do introductions first, get to know people maybe. Uh, I just, that's why I put like a space in between, like a new line. So, but people kept on, on appending to it, which is fine. But let's maybe just like quickly introduce ourselves or something like um, there are two unfamiliar faces. I don't know about if you feel comfortable speaking up, be free to go ahead. Um, I'm Matthias. I, I work at Polar Signals with Kemal, Frederick and Sumera, and I'm working on the storage side of, of Parker. So that's what I do. I can go next. Uh, yeah, my name is Kemal. Uh, I am the host, but I'm a new be on this job. I'm also, as Matthias mentioned, working for Polar Signals, and I'm mostly focused on the Parker agent stuff nowadays. I can go next. Uh, hey, I'm Frederick. Oh, we've got one more person joining us. Cool. Um, I'm Frederick, founder of Polar Signals, um, and uh, I originally created uh, the Conprof project as well, which is kind of the previous evolution of, of, of the Parker project and kind of all the experience that we made with that project kind of inspired what we're doing now uh, in Parker. That's it. Anybody else? Anyone else? I think I'll go next. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sumaira. Uh, I'm working at Polo Signals as a junior software engineer, and I'm mostly focused on Parker Agent for now. Nice to meet you all. I can go next. Um, hello everyone, I'm Darshan. I work out of Bangalore, India, uh, at a company called Gojek. It's a ride-hailing company from Indonesia. I um, I'm planning to basically work on improving the observability stack of my team, at least like uh, the services that we own. Um, and so from that, I got it started with Prometheus. Uh, and I'm also exploring Parker and see if it's a good you, you fit for our use case. So, yeah. Super cool. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear more. Um, let's hear everyone else's uh, intros, but I'm super curious about your your needs. Yeah, so right now we we do not have any observability essentially. We are just running blind. We have a new relic installed, um, but but but, but we, we have no place for business metrics. So that's the promises side, and we basically do logs on ELK stack, but but, but we have no visibility into like uh, if if a system is slow, why it is slow and all that stuff. So I, I have a very very faint idea of Parker. I saw the KubeCon talks. And I thought it's super interesting, especially the BPF part. So I, I, I thought it's it might be very interesting to basically learn more about BPF and deploy Parka and see how it works. And in the meantime, if possible, also become a contributor by sort of getting to know the internals and all that. I originally thought it's a very new project, but you mentioned it. It's it's not quite new. It it, it, it had a different name earlier. So. Yeah, let's let's go through uh, introductions and then I can talk more about that. Okay. Mm, I think I'll go next. Uh, I'm Rohit. I added in the a document as well. I uh, just wanted to come by and say hi. Uh, this was the first, you know, this is the first office hours. I also attend uh, Matthias's uh, Twitch streams. Uh, I attended two of them. Uh, they were pretty cool. And uh, as for me, I work as a you know, software engineer at a company called uh, Citadel Labs. It's part of uh, CNCF as well. Uh, so I'm new to CNCF. I'm just checking out projects. And I got to know about uh, 
here and that's how I got here. Yeah. Super cool. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Palash. I work for a company called Percona. We make uh, database monitoring tools. We write a ton of Go. Uh, so I, I think I came across uh, not Parker, but Polar Signals when I think you made the tweet that, that you're founding a new company. And uh, and then like uh, after that, I didn't check it out. But recently, I, I got interested in it because I, I want to uh, uh, use it uh, for our project. It's called PMM, Percona Monitoring and Management. And there's this hairy bug that I introduced. <laughs> so I was thinking about profiling with it, but uh, I just haven't been able to find the time. But uh, yeah, I am looking forward to trying Parker. That's super cool. Uh, maybe we can uh, we can share uh, a couple of, of of thoughts and hints of what you you can maybe check out. Very cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, maybe I can talk a, a, a very brief second about um, like the history of the project. So originally, it kind of came out of. Um, I mean, I originally saw like this uh, white paper that uh, Google had published about something that they call Google White Profiling. If, if any of you have worked at Google, maybe you're familiar with the GWP. That's what they call it internally. Um, and essentially, Google described how they were using like profiling techniques to profile their entire infrastructure. And just by measuring this, they uh, kind of had the super superpower of being able to optimize things in a very um, um, in a very focused manner. Because they were uh, uh, measuring everything, they exactly knew where their biggest wins were, right? And so this was very, um, uh, very useful for them for cost saving um, measures, but also for you know optimizing latency or stuff like that. Um, and so that's where I originally uh, became interested in this. Um, and I put together this proof of concept that I very creatively called ConProf, you know, continuous profiling. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I actually got super lucky and got to present this um, at a uh, at an invited keynote at, at KubeCon um, a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, I guess uh, part of it is, is history now. And um, <clears throat> uh, end of last year, I founded Polar Signals and to kind of pursue this full time. And um, since then, we've made a bunch of learnings of how people want to use this type of software. And that's kind of where the Parka project now came from, from all of this kind of early feedback that we've gotten from users of the Polar Signals product. Um, and we kind of wanted to give this back um, in form of a, an open source project. We've got more people joining, cool. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the the origin story of the of the Parka Parka project. Um, that said, um, as we were getting Parka ready to be published um, publicly, um, I think we've basically re rewritten almost a hundred percent of it um, since Conprof time. So you can think of it either way, whether it's a new project or not. It's definitely the code is almost entirely. Uh, written in 2021. Does that answer the questions from, from earlier? Yes, it does. Uh, my intention basically was to, I mean, I, I wanted to hack the project in the way, uh, for example, if it's new, I could jump in and be an impactful contributor. <laughs> like in Prometheus, it's really difficult because it's so mature. So like, okay, wait, this is a fancy project. I can, it looks so interesting, looks something which I can use every day. I'll just go in and be a, uh, like a, a big contributor there. But then you mentioned it's, it's, uh, it's ancient. I mean, it's old. So, but yeah, super excited to be here. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's certainly very new and there are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So. Um, there's definitely a lot of room for new contributors, um, and we'd love to, you know, find find some stuff uh, for you to hack on if you're interested in that. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we yeah. can rephrase it as like 
some of the source code might be like two years, three years old, and the idea is is old. But like we're just getting started building the community around the project, and like all the things we need to work on, um, or that like the community wants, they are still out there and they are still ready to take. And there are like as Frederick said, so many opportunities to contribute to make an impact. And there are also like some low hanging fruits which take like an hour or two to, to just like get, get started with. But then there are like super complicated, um, super interesting problems, everything from like storage to eBPF to, I don't know, just integrating different Prometheus libraries that we use or like making sure they work correctly. And like, yeah, like there's like no, no worries about being too late if that's what you're like getting out of this. Like <laughs> it's definitely very early. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, thank you. So yeah, I, I would recommend if you're interested in in contributing, uh, head over to our Discord. Um, maybe someone can drop a link uh, in here if you're not already uh, on there. But um, everyone's super helpful on there if you have any questions. Or as I said, like if you're looking for your first thing to contribute, we're more than happy to, to chat with you and find something um, that you can work on. Is there like, a high level thing like ebpf storage prometheus integration anything that kind of stands out already for you so then we can like kind of like um already tell you who to talk to in more detail basically yeah i mean the bpf thingy is obviously very fancy um uh, but i have no clue at all so i think i'll probably have to just get the basics first uh, before i can start like looking at the code or something like that yeah, so, so there are Kamal and Sumera in this call who are working on those um, parts of the project. So just join the Discord and reach out to Kamal and Sumera and, and you'll be ready to go basically from there. You know who to talk to. Okay, awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. I already right. put the Discord link if anyone wants to join. Let's make sure if you haven't already put it also in the meeting notes. Yeah, already okay. in there as well. Super cool. OK. Uh, so I guess uh, then, yeah. then I'll get started with the actual agenda. But I think that was super valuable to, to cover first. And then there's Ben joining. Familiar face <laughs> from Thanos community. Oops, now I'm showing the wrong tab, but that's fine. Right, so um, I don't know if you've seen the tweet, but um, last week um, we got the chance to to add Parker to the Sivo marketplace um, to have like a single click kind of deployment into a Kubernetes cluster with the Parker agent. And I just want to like show you, I mean, first of all, how easy it is to start a, a cluster on Sivo. Um, but then also um, how cool it is to just have something ready to to use in there as well. So we can just like create a um, oops, parkhead place. Uh, just create a cluster using three nodes. Um, use the default firewall and then take some nice nodes. And then obviously. Um, we have a bunch of different apps that we can install. So maybe traffic, maybe um, maybe what else is there? I guess Minio is cool. Um, and in the monitoring tab, we now have next to uh, Loki, Jaeger, um, and Prometheus operator and the data. We also have Parka and kind of like I guess that's why we're here. So let's deploy that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, they have a bunch of, of other really good good things like um, chaos meshes and, and stuff. Um, I'll let you dig through that as well on your own if you are interested. But that's really it. Like we are basically done creating a cluster. And if we, if we create that cluster now, um, you can see it's already provisioning the nodes. Um, I guess there's one node missing, is there? Um, but let's give this a second, and we should be able to also download the um, kubeconfig any moment. 
And what it does in the background, we basically, with each release of Parker and the Parker agent, we kind of compile a YAML, like a set of YAML files out of the JSON that we have um, in, in the Parker repositories. And then we get basically a ready to go set of YAML files for Kubernetes that can just drop into a cluster. And all this took to, to kind of add to the marketplace is like another meta YAML file where we kind of like specify like the description, like add a logo, kind of make it kind of nice looking basically. And then um, really the only thing um, that I did uh, to those compiled YAML files that we have with each release is uh, kind of combining them. So we do com combine them so you get the Parker storage or server and then also the um, Parker agent as a daemon set deployed and kind of like you don't need to do anything. Um, both will be there. Um, and, and that's really it. Um, let's see, still building the, the cluster, the nodes are up. Uh, and there's the cube config finally. So let's get that on to the machine. And let me whoops, let me open a new tab, or actually a window. So I need to re start sharing the terminal. Is that big enough? I hope so. Um, and then not cat this, but actually use the cube config we've downloaded and running uh, get all pods. We can already see um, that like the cluster is is up and running. And next to the traffic cluster, there should be. Did I miss clicking on Parker? No. There should be already some Parker nodes coming up, like pods. That is interesting now. I guess let's let's debug this. Get the deployment in the Parker namespace. There's no Parker names. Oh, there is a Parker namespace. No deployment in that. No, we don't have a Parker names. Did I actually not click on? on that correctly. It says already installed. So I tried this yesterday and it worked. Great demo. Demo guards aren't with me. So this is interesting. Yeah, I actually have no clue why this didn't work. Um, let's get all deployments from all namespaces. Hmm. So there is no deployment. And let's get ES for daemon set. Also, no Parker region daemon set. Well, that's interesting. I have no clue what happened there. Um, <laughs> has to be something on the CIVO yeah, side. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm from the CIVO Go team. So ah, awesome, we, yeah. we deployed uh, the new API. So it's it sort of has this minor bugs, I guess. So. Uh, would be happy to debug and take it up uh, to the team if you can give us your. Uh, yeah, let me. Right? Yeah, I do. I do. Just give us a cluster. Yeah. Let Let me just apply. So basically, the thing that gets applied is this app YAML file that um, I was talking about that is merged. So, um, if that bug in the API server is fixed, then what you would get is actually what we're seeing now. So. A cluster would start, and you immediately would have um, Parker up and running and the agent. So usually, you wouldn't need to run kubectl apply, but it would just do that for you, and then you would end up in this state. Um, and also, um, when, when you're done installing, it um, should say this to you so you can port forward to the Parker pod by using 
using uh, this command. Let's do that. And then uh, let me share the browser again. Um, share a tab. Um, and then share the other tab. And there we are. And that is Parker running on the Cibo Cloud. And without us doing any any other configuration, so now because of that bug, um, I guess it happens. We all get that. We're here for reliability reasons. Um, we we had to apply it manually, but usually you should get it out of the box. And then, um, yeah, like the next time you you create a cluster, it should already have this in here. And because it's using eBPF, it can kind of like discover everything running in that cluster, and um, it will start. Um, yeah, kind of like looking for for profiles um, to to send to like the agent will look for profiles to send to Parka the server or the storage, and then we now can um, yeah let's look at everything that is in the cube system namespace. And I really like to, for example, look at the core DNS container, and then yeah, kind of out of the box we get like nice profiles for for Go applications in this case. Um, I don't even think there's anything non-Go by default in a Kubernetes cluster is there. Um, but yeah, like any compiled language should kind of show up and then hopefully it can symbolize uh, can symbolize those uh, binaries as well, but they should definitely show up and then you can just like play around with them um, just like that and kind of like maybe create the cluster, have Parker pre-installed, and then deploy your thing you need to troubleshoot. And you don't need to worry about Parker or like spinning up Kubernetes or whatever. It's just kind of there. And you can kind of take take your troubleshooting from there. I think that's a pretty pretty nice user experience. Um, that's it. That's what I wanted to show. Um, obviously, we can kind of merge all the profiles together and then see where like Cordine DNS in this case has spent like most of its CPU time in the last like minute since it started uh, profiling this. Any questions? Now's the chance. Now I can answer in person and you can ask in person compared to the Twitch stream. <laughs> Anything you want to dive into? I have a small question. Uh, is sure. it possible to choose what pods you want to profile basically by maybe adding a label, etc. So I think that's doable. Um, Kemal was nodding, and it should be possible. You need to um, configure that on the Parker agent, um, so it would discover which pods kind of to to care about. Um, I don't actually know how to do that, um, if I'm honest, because I don't care. I just profile everything. It's so low overhead. Um, yeah, that's that's basically why I don't care. Um, I just kind of like start the agents and they start scraping or not even scraping. They just like start picking up things and sending them to Parker. But yeah, it's possible to configure via a config file, I guess, Kimma, is it? It's a flag right now. Oh, flag. Uh, and we already have a documentation around it. I will find the section for you and just put that in here in the messages and the door as well. Yeah, very good question. So you can kind of like slice and dice it however you need. Yeah, there's what there's one more cool thing um, that uh, is being worked on right now, which is relabeling support. If you're already familiar with Prometheus, uh, there's soon going to be support for for relabeling so that you can you, using the typical Prometheus relabeling rules, you can choose which um, which containers and pods to profile. And that also means that consequently, we could ignore certain pods um, if you have a specific annotation, for example, on um, uh, on your pod, if that's a, a We'll we'll see, you know, what the kind of workflows are that people are going to like. But I, I imagine that sometimes, you know, we have maybe a, an extremely performance sensitive workload. Maybe with those, you don't want the EBPF program to 
um, add, even if it's a very, very, very tiny amount of overhead, maybe you don't want to. Um, I, I imagine maybe those kinds of workflows will exist in the future. Um, but I think this is a good uh, segue also to, to the second topic. Um, so uh, maybe I can give a very quick, um, oh yeah, okay, uh, one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. So my question was, uh, wouldn't you need to load the BPF program into the core DNS? Uh, 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 like the, the 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 place where it's running, right? How do you manage to scrape uh, the trace, like the profile? How do you how do you manage to profile the the program which is not on this, like if, if, which is in a different namespace, in a different container? Yeah. So uh, actually, I. I... Uh, I gave a talk at KubeCon about this, and I was thinking that a question might, like this might uh, pop up. So let me just share this slide from, from that. I think you can see the slide now. Yep. So um, basically, the way that it works is that um, there's a, um, a a uh, subsystem in the Linux kernel called the perf event system. Um, and using it, you can attach any eBPF program uh, to a file descriptor, essentially. Uh, and the file descriptor can be, um, can represent a process, uh, but in our case, it represents a C group. And so we obtain we discover essentially which C group a container belongs to. Um, and uh, using that, we attach that eBPF program to that uh, C group. And so that way we can actually attach it to all the containers from outside, from basically um, kernel wide of the entire host. Um, and then the way that the collection works is that every time the eBPF program is called, um, we essentially look at what are the current stack traces uh, that are being executed. And these we write into these eBPF maps that we can see here. Um, so essentially, we have an identifier for a stack. And that stack um, is just made up of memory addresses. Um, and that's essentially all the, um, um, all the thing, everything that the eBPF program does. It's like, it's really simple when you when you think about it. Um, it's just because of how uh, code gets executed by a CPU. It's literally the addresses of memory that are being executed, um, and that that's that's all. But in order to for us as humans to be able to make sense of this and not just um, yes um, yes Parka Parka does need to be run as root uh, in order to load eBPF programs because uh, yeah. You just need to be very privileged to, to be able to load eBPF programs. Um, what I was saying was, um, in order for us humans to be able to make sense of these stack traces, we need to not have them be just memory addresses, right? Like I can't look at this memory address and say, ah, this is my function X, Y, Z, right? And so this is where a different process uh, comes into play that we call symbolization. And this is really simple when we have a, a Go program, for example just like what Matthias just showed, because Go programs are actually compiled to native code. So the kind of code that our CPU can actually execute. Um, that, however, um, is quite different with dynamic languages. But let's cover the um, like uh, native languages for a second, like Go. Um, with Go, the binary actually gets mapped, memory mapped in, um, in the Linux kernel. Uh, and then the memory addresses that we see in eBPF can actually be pointed back to a place in our Go binary. And then using a couple of lookup tables, we can actually find which Go function that was originally. Um, so that's why with native programs, just like Matthias said, when they're compiled, compiled languages, uh, so in quote, quotes, um, then uh, we can actually do this lookup quite uh, quite easily. It gets much more complicated when we talk about um, dynamic languages like Node.js or Java, uh, where you know we don't have this 
artifact that we're compiling to native code. Um, but luckily, most of these use something called a just-in-time compiler. And just-in-time compilers essentially just means that based on what we're executing, we're going to be compiling uh, this dynamic code actually down to real machine exe executable code for performance purposes. Um, and so at that point, the virtual machine, so like our Node.js or our JVM, actually just needs to write to somewhere um, what these memory addresses of our just-in-time compiled code um, refer to. And so let me give you an example of what that could look like. Um, I've got a very simple Node.js app here. So this is an, an example app that we have under the Polar Signals org. Um, but uh, here, essentially, this is the, the crux of uh, this program. So we have just an HTTP handler on Slash that has a very expensive loop. Um, and then we just uh, we execute that loop and we write hello to our output. So if we run this um, and then we add this very specific flag, perf basic prof, this tells our Node.js runtime. Um, let's find this process. to write a file into a specific location. And that's this location. And what we're seeing here now, um, what I just printed to my terminal, we can see memory addresses that then correspond to files and um, locations in those files. So this information we can now use again to symbolize even dynamic stack traces. Um, and so this is something that we've been working on implementing in, um, in the Parker agent, that the Parker agent automatically discovers this file um, to symbolize um, even dynamic languages. Because the difficulty is dynamic languages have to be symbolized on the host, because we can never predict how uh, the just-in-time compiler is going to compile that code to native, native code. So we can't do that after the fact. With native binaries, actually, what's really cool is that we can just send these raw memory addresses to the Parka server. And the Parka server does these uh, symbolization steps asynchronously in the background. Um, so, uh, And then the last thing that now becomes a little bit difficult, and this is when we get to oops, Kubernetes, I think. I oh, know I haven't started this app yet here. And you'll see where I'm going with this in a second. I'm running this app in my local Minikube cluster. Um, and while it's, uh, it's creating, uh, we let's go back one more time to this cat that we had here, right? We had our exact uh, process ID. Um, so let's remember this because it will become important when once we talk about uh, Kubernetes. So in this, uh, let's make sure that this pop is running. Okay, so we've got it running. And now we're going to look at this process in our mini kube. So here, um, I started it the same way as we started it uh, outside of Kubernetes. So in this case, um, let me show you. So using the procfs in, um, in Linux, you can actually find the containers root like this. Um, and now we're going to start looking for this perf map again. And here we're now uh, stumbling over something that is a little bit curious, because even though our process ID was 5202, now our perf map is um, using the process ID 1. The reason why this happens is because uh, we're using Linux namespaces to construct, constrain what our container can see, right? And so naturally, it cannot use this process ID anymore because that would be leaking information from outside of this 
sandbox environment uh, to our process. And so the Parker agent essentially needs to figure out what um, the, let's say, namespace local process ID of this process is within this container. And the, the way that we do this is using uh, the procfs again. Um, and we use uh, this file called status, which has a bunch of information. But the one that we're interested in is this one. And now we've got the information that we wanted. We could see our kernel-wide process ID, 5202. And then theoretically, there could be a series of numbers here. But um, in this case, we only have our like kernel ID, process ID, as well as the container local one. You can nest um, process namespaces, basically. But in this case, we now know what is the correct uh, perf map for this particular container. And now we can take this to the root, PMP, and uh, as I said, perf-1.map, I think it is. Yeah. And now we've discovered the same thing. So this is something that we're working on implementing support for right now in Parka Agent. And the cool thing about this is this is kind of a standard. These perf maps are kind of a standard in the Linux kernel or generally on Linux. And so most just in time compiled uh, runtimes have some sort of flag to, to write this out. And what makes this particularly exciting is that now we don't need to implement support for you know Java, Node.js, Erlang, and all of these languages that have just-in-time compilers. Um, because all they need to do is write out this file, and Parker Agent can automatically pick it up and uh, profile it. So I think, I think that's exciting, because it means we can support so many languages um, really simply just by adding flags uh, to running those apps. So yeah, that's all I wanted to wanted to share. I guess I want to chime in. One natural question about this: uh, what we do uh, when we don't have a just-in-time compiler in the runtime? Yeah, so this is uh, this gets more difficult. Um, essentially, we need to read the process memory and try to find the stack traces that it builds. Somehow, like for the for example, Ruby doesn't have a just-in-time compiler yet. Um, it still somehow takes uh, keeps keeps track of stacks that are being executed right now. So we'll need to read the raw memory of those processes to be able to discover that, but it is also possible. It just needs more deeper integrations for the specific runtime. It'll come as well. And hopefully, one day, we won't even need people to run their applications with these specific flags. Um, but we can have these deep, deep integrations even for those languages that have just-in-time compilers. But this is a great intermediate step to get people going um, who are able to change their deployment very slightly. It's cool. How, like, maybe the next question about the same topic, like, like considering all those uh, runtimes and languages and uh, implementations of uh, JITs, uh, like, do they actually expose those maps? Like, or is it something not common? Do we need to go and contribute this? So for practically every JIT that I've seen um, and, and explored, uh, it does exist. Um, so yeah, it's, it's already a very common thing because this is already uh, common from like the pre-EBPF perf area uh, era. Um, a lot of just-in-time compilers and virtual machines already implement this. So. I've not found one that doesn't. Sounds amazing. Right. Any other questions? I have a bit generic question. Uh, so, will profiling also be part of, like, in some distant future, uh, part of open telemetry to instrument our apps with or something like that? Is that going to be a possible at some point, or oh, just like to hear about? So we, we're we're actually working with like um, the Open Telemetry EVPF working group, 
Um, so it could be that you know we we may come up with some sort of wire format or standards. Um, I think the space is still so young that it's not the right time to define standards, but I'm pretty sure this will happen at one point in the future, yeah. And like we're already using an open standard, which is pprof. Um, everything that we do, the agent produces pprof. Um, Parka ingests pprof, um, and you can download pprof from Parka again. So kind of everything revolves around this format in Parka. So essentially, the the standard that we're using already exists and has already been defined pre pre Parka. But uh, there's definitely yeah. more interest to formalize it within uh, Open Telemetry as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Parka, I knew that pre-Parka uh, wasn't just a good thing. Uh, also, like, uh, is OTL like is the Open Telemetry protocol not uh, compatible with pre or something like? Can't it fit there, or is there something else to it? Not really. Um, the 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 thing is, pprof is kind of in um, aggregate uh, format, which doesn't really work with even like either the tracing or the metrics format. So it is really something quite unique. Yes. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Or anything you want to add? You can just say hi. I just wanted to uh, leave one more comment uh, because you were asking about um, uh, or you were talking about a bug in Percona or in, in the tool that you were you were working on. If there's anything in particular that we can uh, like, you know, help try and answer, um, you know, we're more than happy to. Yeah, uh, so like <clears throat> that bug was like a year ago and I, I didn't get time to work on it. Uh, but I am there on the Parker Discord. So uh, whenever I do, I'm, I'm planning to in a few weeks, uh, I, I will shoot my questions here, sure. Super cool. Ho hopefully, you know, because of our very deep Go integrations and everything, it should be a breeze for you to deploy it and profile your, your apps. Awesome, looking forward to it. Now is the time to ask the question of a uh, profiling you always wanted to ask. <laughs> Anything else? If not, then you can write the questions that might come up either in the Discord or you bring them to the next Parka office hours in two weeks because we have this be weekly. So you can just join again in two weeks and we can have a new conversation. Um, maybe folks have issues they looked at over the uh, next two weeks and they want to start um, writing a PR and need help getting started. Um, yeah, just kind of whatever there is, um, just put it into the agenda. Um, and then we can can talk about that. Um, and yeah, contributions are very welcome. And there are lots of things to do, for sure. Um, but also, obviously, user stories are interesting. If there's anything you you can kind of like uh, showcase, like, hey, I had this bug, um, and this is how we solved it by using profiling, then we're more than happy to have you present here as well because that's super interesting for us like we're using profiling and continuous profiling with parka on parka so it's kind of a meta thing but we are totally interested in kind of what things you are profiling so if if there's anything to show then yeah that's definitely a good thing to put on the agenda as well Cool. Maybe one last question uh, from me, Matthias. When is the next Twitch stream? Uh, yeah, I think uh, 
probably tomorrow, like the last two weeks were kind of busy. But yeah, like and looking at my calendar, I definitely jump into the, into a green screen and a <laughs> Twitch mode again, and then start uh, hacking on some some Parker stuff. The idea really being, I work on this open source project anyway, and it is open, uh, and everybody can see the source code. So why not stream writing the source code, and then you can see what what we are up to. But you can also ask questions there. Um, I'm also happy to kind of like have someone come on and we'll take a look at some some like uh, Parka pull requests or something. Um, that would be would be interesting as well. Kind of like pair on some stuff to get you started. Um, but yeah, I think tomorrow definitely. Today were a couple of meetings, so I didn't manage to. But tomorrow and the days after are definitely Twitch days again. Yeah. Cool. Looking forward to it. All right. I guess for this week, we can close it up. And yeah, uh, check out our Discord. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can just come and join. And that's it. See you in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.